So Kevin Peterson's book is really all the talk in the cricket world right now. It's almost as if nothing else is happening anywhere in that, in that uh, uh, circuit. And uh, there's a brave children and Anand Vasu are here to make sense of what's really going on. It's, it's obviously rather complicated. Lots of bad guys out there. Kevin Peterson, seemingly the good guy, at least from his account and, and a couple of other accounts. But then if you want, you want to start by talking about the way things have panned out since that first PR exercise of you know taking all extracts from the book and making it public. Well, I think the, the ECB gave uh, Kevin an eight-month PR exercise almost the whole uh, keeping it under wraps for this long was just frankly disastrous. It allowed people to talk about nothing else for so long and it gave the book the best possible build up and he's cashed in on that and also since the book came out the way they've reacted has been frankly disastrous. I mean the leaking of a, a, a dossier and all of that, it, it looks really tacky and it's not, uh, if they'd shown that they were above this kind of name calling, uh, it would have shown them in good light but the response really has shown the ECB in very poor light and it's made Peterson look like the good guy. Like Just to take that forward, did the ECB have an option once they had sort of exiled Peterson? Could they have done things differently? I think one uh, aspect in which the ECB was always going to be hamstrung in this situation is that the player is the one who the public really associate with. The fans have some sort of feeling, whether it's good, bad, in Peterson's case it is heavily polarised there. He's obviously England's most exciting cricketer of the last 20-25 years. And that that means that fans had an attachment to him, even despite his antics and the kind of negative press that he got for certain things, his public falling out, fallings out with coaches, with uh, some of his teammates, in different places that he travelled to, that dual identity of South Africa, England, through all of that, it was still uh, Peterson, the player, was someone who connected with the fans. Whereas you, a backroom board official is never going to have that kind of connect. So I think the ECB were anyway in a bad place, but they certainly didn't do themselves any favours. But, but uh, could they have done things differently really? And now, can they do any damage control anymore? Do they have any options left at all or they're just going to be pushed further and further back because of the way things are evolving now? I think sometimes silence is the best option, but uh, uh, I don't know where they're getting their advice from. The ECB is a very professionally run setup. They, I'm sure they've spoken to top PR guys and lawyers and image makers and that kind of thing, and they will now be considering every move very carefully. But I'm not sure this is a battle that they could ever win in the public domain. The, like Dilip pointed out, the smart thing uh, for my money would have been to keep quiet and make Peterson look like the spoiled child who was complaining about everyone else. But some of these attacks have been so specific, so detailed and so personal, having not read the book but only uh, gone by extracts, uh, that they couldn't also just do nothing. Mm. And they can't openly take Peterson on yet, or they haven't done so far. So things happening through leaks, through uh, information going through the newspapers and TV channels and that sort of thing, it, it hasn't made the ECB look any good. And like the website almost gave him the time instead to write the book, you know, giving him eight months of, uh, six or eight months of time. But then, um, Anand was talking more about the ECB, of course, that's what we were talking about. But what about the England team? It's, it's, it's a mess, uh, isn't it? I mean, that's what it sounds like. We don't know if that's only Peterson's version, but stuff that a ponting or a split who are obviously trying to get a little upper hand out there. As well as some former England cricketers, Nasser Hussain among them have sort of said that, you know, it's believable. What Peterson saying is believable. So it doesn't really say, it doesn't paint a too, too rosy a picture about the England team. My, my question is, is any team really different though? Especially once the team starts losing or going downhill. Uh, many of these episodes date back to 2012 when England had gone past the crest of the wave and started going downhill. Uh, and a, a losing team, uh, that South Africa series they lost mm -hmm. in a, a losing dressing room is seldom a happy dressing room. We recently room. saw that with Australia and India as well. Exactly, so that's when you get most of these issues cropping up. I think the one disturbing thing for England is, like you said, corroboration from the uh, former players. I, I would take with a pinch of salt what Ponting or Smith said because they'd be looking to put the boot 
system perhaps, but when your own former players Harmson is a lot of great players now. Yeah, the treble being one, Harmson is a, was a big part of Nash's campaign. So when those players start taking it, you perhaps have to maybe look at the culture of your team and, and see what you can change. Both of you have travelled extensively around the cricket world. I take this to you on um, the culture of bullying that that um, Peterson's talking about. I suppose in a school or college situation, it would exist. I mean, seniors, you know, gang up against a new guy. It does happen. Is it something that's rampant in, in, in the cricket world as well? Well, bullying takes different forms. Absolutely. The obvious one is the is the schoolboy thing, which we all understand, where there's one personality that is so dominant and and basically puts down uh, the uh, the weakest links in a team. But I, I think in any group, when you have cliques and when you have uh, uh, groups within a group, or, or bowlers versus batsmen, for example, that's the most obvious thing. But there are other ways. Some people are naturally closer to each other. In India, it's the regions. It could be regions. It, uh, on whatever basis, when you have these cliques forming within the team, there's bound to be situations in which one person is isolated and when perhaps when he's not doing well, when the team's not doing well, when he's done something that others think has cost them a game, there are going to be situations in which there's finger pointing and it's extremely unpleasant for, for any individual to be in that kind of situation. For that to happen within the closed confines of a dressing room is one thing, mm -hmm. but when it starts leaking out into the public domain and we saw the obvious glee that uh, some people were taking over the uh, parody Twitter account uh, and People ask why is KP so upset about that, it's just a Twitter thing, he should laugh it off. He could have laughed it off if it was a stand-up comedian or if it was a uh, wisecracking journalist or something like that. But when he got the feeling, and it seems to be corroborated that others in the team were involved in some manner, uh, it, 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 must have, uh, it must have pulled the rug from under him because the team environment is something that's supposed to be sacred and supposed to be uh, sacrosanct in that you might argue among each other, but it doesn't go outside the confines of the dressing room. When it does go out, then it just gets more and more unpleasant. But does this, uh, you know, if, if we accept what Alan is saying, forget the lines being crossed, which, which has happened in this case, seemingly, but if we accept that there's some amount of, you know, cliques forming and, and, and bullying happening, and seeing that the England cricketers, Swan is out of the picture now, but the rest of them are all in it. They are all professionals who know this. They, they, they would have known that the, these things were happening. So, in that sense, maybe they really won't be affected by this. It's just us thinking that you know, the England team will be destroyed because of these revelations and stuff like that. But, but for them, they would have probably just known about it and just... Uh, a lot of players will brush this off as banter. I mean, there's mm -hmm. probably a thin line between what someone sees as bullying and what somebody else sees as banter. Every organization, including this office, has banter going on day after day. Uh, the problem is when it starts to get ugly and personal and when individuals are affected, like Khan said in, in KP's case with the fake uh, Twitter account or the fake player account. Uh, we've seen that happen in India during the Greg Chapel years with their front return with certain senior players. And it really did affect him. It affected him badly. I've, I've seen that in person. Um, when it gets to that stage, the team management or whoever's in charge, especially the captain, has to step in. Uh, what we're reading in the media right now is that some of the England players don't think there is a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's purely a judgment call. I guess only those who are within the confines of the dressing room are qualified to really comment on what the culture is. Just before wrapping up, Alan, uh, obviously there's no problem with the sales of the book, uh, but what other fallout do you expect from it? Is there going to be any long-term effect, anything tangible sort of taking place, apart from the sales of the books? I think one thing that's for certain is that if there was even a 0.001% chance of Peterson playing for England ever again, that seems to be well and truly decided. I can't see how he can get back into the setup because there are too many people that would have to be removed before Peterson would come back. And it's not as though he's been scoring runs by the bucket load for seven eight games. Not in no, 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 the four game. And I think the I think the biggest fallout or, or not fallout learning that that should be taken from this 
is how the whole world has reacted to this. I mean, it's essentially an issue between an England player, his teammates, and his board. But it it has it's gone much beyond that now. I think the rest of the cricket world can also learn a lesson in terms of what not to do. Peterson's done many things that he shouldn't have, Absolutely. and he's admitted to a lot of them. We haven't had a single admission of that kind from the people he has accused, whether it is Andy Flower, whether it's his teammates, whether it's Peterson's board. We've not had one person come and make even a small concession saying, look, we handled this badly. We shouldn't have done this, we should have done something else. Maybe it need not have come to this pass, but now it has. And Peterson's um, uh, persona extends much beyond England. He's, he's much loved as a player by neutral territories. He plays all around the world, of course. And in India especially, his brand of cricket is something that has got a huge following. And so, and no Indian fan is interested in the ECB's problems, nor should they be, yeah. uh, or whether Andy Flower is the best coach or not. The Indian fan only wanted to see Peterson play as much as they could, as long as he wasn't making runs against India. So in that sense, I think uh, while English fans and the England board might have a problem with Peterson, I don't think neutral fans around the world really uh, associate much with those problems. All they can see is that one of the most gifted players of our time had his career cut short uh, when perhaps he could have given us more joy. Mm, absolutely. For, for the moment, of course, Peterson's quite the good guy and uh, he's got this band of bad, bad guys around him and he's winning that battle and so, so uh, the, the, the book sales are also going as expected. We'll leave it there for now and uh, maybe catch up next week for another discussion of this sort. Thanks. Thank you.